Imagine if you're in the data business and somebody's like, how do I know what to look for? At first, it sounds like a naive question. You're like, well, it's the data. You look in the data. You, <laughs> I don't know. You, you find it. You do whatever. Right. And eventually, you realize that it's actually a really profound observation. What they're saying is that all of our coping mechanisms are breaking down. Peter Sanington, your big game hunter. And guys, we have our sights on someone special. <laughs> no, today. Only a mother Peter could invest in this idea. <laughs> <laughs> made this like super artistic. <laughs> that is actually absolutely correct. Um, and that's a very, very astute assessment, actually. True startup story, guys. You got it. Your company just got seed round financed. Congratulations. You're going to the moon. But now you have to scale. You found great talent out in California, New York, Georgia, and even Eastern Europe. So what communications platform will you be using to ensure your international team is always aligned? Well, the answer is easy. Slack.com for teams. We've used Slack for all of our previous startups and they've supported us in tremendous ways. And we want to give them a thanks today for supporting vchunting.com. Did you also know that Slack is a great tool for personal use? Yeah, I use my own personal Slack channel to drop in documents, notes, to-dos, and follow-ups to ensure that my workflow throughout the day is right on course. I promise you, if you try out slack.com for personal use, you'll end up using it for your team as well. Go to slack.com to check it out. Welcome everybody to season two of VC Hunting with me, your host, Peter Saddington. I'm super excited for this conversation that we're going to be having today. I scoped out this guy, Sean Burns, the CEO of Outlier and Angel Investor right there on the Twitters. I slid into his DMs and asked him if he wanted to come on the show and he said yes. So Sean, thanks so much for being here today. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Awesome. So I want to get to know you. I just, I'm really curious. And I'll tell you the reason why. As a trained data scientist, I got a master's, uh, three master's degrees actually, but as a trained data scientist, I saw the word outlier. And that mm -hmm. was the first thing. And so for me, coming from big data science, I was like, what is this guy all about? So tell me, what is outlier? What is it all about? And why did you decide to create this type of company? Uh, it's a good question. So I've been a founder for a lot of years, mostly in the data analytics space. And what I realized was your modern business today has just so much data, more than they've ever had before, coming out of every part of their business. And they have a lot of great tools, um, some of which I'm sure you've used, everyone's used, um, dashboarding tools, research tools. The problem is all those tools are really good, but only if you know the question to ask of them. So you have a question, you can get an answer. But how do you know what questions to ask in the first place? And that became the founding principle of Outlier was, we need a new generation of tools, a new generation of products that can look at vast amounts of data and bring us the questions that we should be asking. Because you think about it, if you're a large consumer business, you have maybe tens of millions, hundreds of millions of consumers that are buying, selling, talking about your products. You need to know about those emerging problems, the emerging opportunities, the shifts in consumer behavior and preference. And the sooner you know that they're happening, the better off you are. But how do you find them? It's like a needle in a haystack. Yeah. So well, job you got is my curiosity. Yeah, well, then our job is to find those needles for you so that you can stay ahead of those changes and unlock the value in data in the way that we've always hoped it would. And so is that is, and, and again, I have a beginner mindset here, so I don't know the ins and outs of it. I'm assuming mm -hmm. immediately from what you just said, are you just so, hooking up a vacuum and sucking out all the data, <laughs> you know, all these integrations and just sucking it down and seeing what's up? I mean, we live what? in data information world now and, mm -hmm. and, the plethora, amount of, the plethora amount of data out there, it's really hard to be able to sift through. So what makes Outlier, and what maybe you can't, don't have to tell us the secret sauce, but how are you doing that? How are you sucking down this data and making sense of it? That's the key question. And, and most of our customers have dozens of integrations because their data lives in dozens of places. It lives in the Salesforce or Adobe clouds or in the Google cloud or Amazon. Uh -huh. It lives in databases and data warehouses. Uh, and I think it lives many places. And the key difference in our approach, we use a lot of machine learning, artificial intelligence, obviously. It's a very sophisticated platform to do that because if you want a system to ask questions for you, you can't spend a lot of time configuring it. You don't tell it what to look for. It literally takes five minutes to connect outlier to the data, and then its job is to bring you questions. There's a lot of mathematics, a lot of data science involved. Right. I think the key interesting aspect of our business is that today we're in a world of data privacy. People care a lot about their privacy. Mm. They have GDPR in Europe. We now in California have CCPA. 
you can't just vacuum the data out of these systems. Even if right. you wanted to, the liability that brings out of these companies is too high. And so Outlier does what's called data in place analysis. The data never leaves those systems. We do the analysis in place. So they never, we aren't worried about moving around this data and, and shifting it around. Because even if you're not going to sell it, even if you're not going to move it, what if hackers find it? Like you don't want to spread it out too much. And so Outlier is a very, the new generation of tools I think like us are designed around privacy where we don't have to send your personal data everywhere it might need to go. We can get the same value out of it if we do a little bit more work, a little bit more data science, a little bit more mathematics, statistics. We can get the same value without having to compromise privacy. You know, it's really interesting because, and, and it's almost like a misnomer, this naming convention of your company, Outlier, because you know as well as I do as a data scientist, you don't make informed decisions off the statistical outlier of a data set. You actually usually throw that away. And so is, is that like, a, is there some sort of pun? Is there some sort of inside joke I'm missing? Well, you, if you think about the, the, the questions outlier brings to you, the insights it's generating, okay. they're always the outliers, the things that don't fit. Because if something's behaving like it always has, then right. probably not the source of it. But almost all, if you think about it, almost all major business decisions start from a change. Something changed, and that right. raises a decision. And that change might be an opportunity, or it could be a problem, but it's always a change. And I think the key thing here is outlier is designed to produce insights the same way a human would. So large patterns, big shifts. So for example, mm. you change your website, that might affect how you sell. It also might affect customer support requests. It might affect the way that your inventory system is tracking things. A lot, you know, the kind of things you'd expect a human to be able to produce from a data set is what Outlier produces. It just does it in an automated fashion at, at mm. scale. So the difference is some, a person may be able to look through a little bit of the data, whereas Outlier can look through all of it. So did this come about because there was some, well, you, you, you said that you, you wanted to be able to figure out and have these emergent questions come to you of sorts. Oh, totally. But uh, what, was there like a, a personal reason? Was there a, like a personal problem that you were trying to solve and this kind of became the genesis of this idea? How did, how did uh, you... How, yeah, absolutely. So I, I, I've been an entrepreneur for a long time. Uh, when I was, I came out of graduate school for machine learning, uh, just like you. I only have one master's degree, though. I don't know where you <laughs> find time for three. That's a lot of them. Uh, I just, I, I wanted to be a founder. I wanted to create companies just because I like to do a lot of different things. I enjoy the multidisciplinary nature. I like to work on product. I like selling. I like marketing. And there aren't a lot of jobs where you can do a variety of things every day. Often you're hired to a job, they want you to do one thing, do it really well, and keep doing it over and over again. And so being a founder was a great fit for me because I like to do lots of different things. Um, I started a company in 2005 called Flurry, um, mm. which we, we grew over nine years to be a large analytics and ads platform, one of the largest analytics platforms in the world, because it was doing analytics for mobile apps. And as the iPhone and Android phones took over the world, Flurry was the dominant leader in tracking it. So if you have a smartphone, there is Flurry software running on your phone somewhere as part of the apps you've downloaded and the exciting part of flurry was that you know not only did i have to grow a big company and that was great um it was we had about a 500,000 customers companies that are using us as part of their apps something like two two point something million apps it, it was flurry. yahoo that that acquired you right? yahoo acquired that in 2014 that's right um but you know i got to meet a lot of these businesses i mean i didn't get to meet all of them or close to a majority of them but i, I met as many of them as i could and the most common thing these companies would ask me regardless of the country they were in, in Asia and Europe, the US, regardless of what kind of company it was, how big it was or small, they all asked me the same thing. They're like, Sean, how do I know what to look for in all this data? And I got that question so many times, countless times from, you know, two person gaming companies that were just building small apps up to Fortune 500, you know, insurance businesses. And I figured if everybody was asking me, nobody had a solution. But it also, it's, it was interesting. So you imagine if you're in the data business and somebody's like, how do I know what to look for? At first, it sounds like a naive question. You're like, well, it's the data. You look in the data. You, I don't know. You, you find it. You do whatever. And eventually you realize that it's actually a really profound observation. What they're saying is that all of our coping mechanisms are breaking down. You know, uh -huh. we used to be able to fit our business on a spreadsheet and it doesn't fit there anymore. We used to be able to fit our business in a dashboard. It doesn't fit on a dozen dashboards anymore. And what That's they're really telling you is, is that I need a new way of dealing with my business that's more sophisticated and more complex. And so it really arose out of that. And so after taking some time off after selling Flurry, I was like, what do I want to do? Um, I've always been, I've been an angel investor for a long time. I have a small investment fund invested in, I don't know, about four dozen companies. Um, maybe I want to be an investor or maybe <laughs> I want to work something else. And 
that I think there's an aspect of being a founder that if you, if you love it, if it's what you like to do, it's stressful, it's hard, it's very, very hard. It's such a hard job. But if you like it, there's very other few things that I think are as fulfilling. And so mm-hmm. I wanted to do it again uh, while I could. Not, not because I'm, I, I think that, you know, people look at founders, you can be, you know, 60 year old and start a great company, 20. It's not about age. And there's a point where I'll be doing this long enough. I won't have enough emotional energy left to go through the stressors <laughs> and the craziness of it. So while I felt like I had enough juice left uh, in me, uh, I wanted to do it again. And that's what we're doing now. That's awesome. There seems to be a common thread um, to talking about, you know, data and patterns. There seems to be a common thread of sadomasochism uh, when it comes to <laughs> founders, right? right? It's like, do you enjoy 20 hour workday? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. So that was a great segue um, that you had into Flurry. And, and it was interesting because Flurry was acquired by Yahoo in 2014. That was actually mm-hmm. the same year that my company was acquired. So I had a question on that is that you said, you just said that you took some time off after Flurry. What, what, what was your expectation? What was your expectation after the acquisition of what you were going to do with your life? I, I, I won't take up a whole lot of time here, but for me, it was, there was a whole bunch of soul searching. Like, what do I do now? What do, what do I, did, did you take a sabbatical? Did you go climb the Alps? Uh, just, 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 I'm just curious. What did you do after the acquisition and how did you fill your time until you landed on, Hey, I want to, I want to grind the gears again. Yeah. I, I, to, so, so why did I take a year off? First of all, it was a good question. Like why take time mm. off? Why don't I just jump right back into something? And exactly. I had, at the time my daughter was 18 months old Ooh. and you're talking about the 20 hour days. Mm-hmm. I, did, I realized I built up a lot of bad habits. I didn't have good work life balance. I wasn't there for her in the way that I wanted to be there. I love and that. you know, I'm the kind of person where if I have a bad habit, I really just need to fundamentally shift my behavior to correct it. I can't like do it by degrees. So taking some time off was a chance to reset. Um, A funny story about that, after resetting, and I I have reset and successfully not gone back to the old difficult days. And I was thinking about starting a company again. I was talking to my wife. I was like, like, you know, I think I'm gonna start a company again. And she was like, no. And I was like, wait, what? That's unexpected. I'm like, it worked out pretty well the first time. Why don't we just do it again? And she was like, absolutely not. And she was just afraid that I would go back to that kind of, you know, 20 hours a day mm. system. I would, I would not be there for the kids. I wouldn't be healthy about it anymore. And it was a really good wake up call for me to say, actually, you know what, can you build a company that's more sustainable? So the new company outlier, you know, we, we, we wrote down our values on day one. They're on our website. We value yes. diversity. We value honesty. We value work-life balance. Um, most, you know, we were parents, me and my co-founder, we wanted to be there for our kids. And so we started a company with the idea, not just to solve this problem, but can you set an example for other tech companies that you can build a business in a healthier way that's more sustainable, that's accessible, accessible to people who have kids, accessible to people in different stages of life. You don't just have to be a 20 something old who's willing to work all day. And I'll tell you, man, now five years in, it's become an enormous asset for us. Our team is great, it's growing. Um, on average, they're more senior than most companies. Most of them have kids, but they're drawn to the idea of a company, a high growth tech company doing interesting work where you can have time with your kids and still do interesting work. And so I think my original investors are a little bit worried about that idea, but it's proven actually to work out quite well. And my hope is that, you know, as we get to succeed, people can follow this model instead of the typical you know, model that people focus on where it's work, 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 and a little bit of life. And, 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 and speaking of that, I think that type of model of work, work, work is really being downplayed. And I appreciate that people are recognizing it for the flaw that, you know, the flawed work model that it is. It's, there used to be, or maybe there still is, I don't know, but I'm over it at least the whole model of work, 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 kill yourself and be proud of it. I I just, that's never been a sustainable model for anybody period. And I'm glad that more people are recognizing that, Hey, look, you know, work-life balance actually is valuable. And I really appreciate Sean, your candor around admitting and, and being transparent that, Hey, you had some bad habits that you, that you, you created through this startup and you wanted to press the reset button, blow in the cartridge and, 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 and try something different. So I really appreciate that. And one thing I want to tell the audience out there, because we have a lot of founders and entrepreneurs and venture capitalists who watch us is Sean, Sean and his blog posts and the way that he communicates and his, his website of, of, um, of outlier really is one of the few websites where I actually really felt that your values and your principles were real. Like, like seriously, yeah. and it's, and maybe it's because Thank I've you. done diligence and I've dug and I've read your, your blog posts, but I want to, I want to segue into this question here. I said, I, I wrote it down here. I said, I love how outspoken and transparent you are on your blog 
and social media. And is that one of your corporate values? Is that one of the things that you wanted to really in, in, instill in this next company outlier and make sure that you were value driven and principle driven rather than yeah. profit motive or anything else? Is that fair? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, and, and to be honest with you, if you've had success in the past, there's this question about what makes it worth it to do it again, mm. right? And the first time around uh, at Flurry, I just wanted to be successful no matter what. And the second time around, what makes it worth it again? Because it can't just be money. Mm. It has to be something more. And the idea of Outlier was that could it stand for something more? Could it be an example of how to build a more healthy, more sustainable business? Like, for example, it's always been important to me to treat employees like people, not like widgets. We, we for example, I've, I've outlawed referring to, to employees as resources because I find it dehumanizes <laughs> people. Like people are people. They have personal lives. If you have a bad day on the personal side, that can affect work and vice versa. Like people are people. Like, but they want to grow. They want to evolve. They aren't just widgets that you push salary in one end and productivity comes out the other. Like let's treat them that way. That's a fair so statement. It, Whenever I hear resources, I usually think of like coal or natural gas. <laughs> exactly. No, it's, and we, we do it every day. We don't realize it either. Like it's at a big company, it ends up becoming part of how you think. It's just, it was important for me to be different. So the hope was that Outlier could stand for a way to build a tech business that was different than most. I've also been a firm believer that diversity is a competitive advantage. And I think a lot, mm -hmm. to your point, a lot of companies give lip service to diversity. They don't do anything about it. Um, I wanted to prove that it actually, if you believe in it and you dedicate to yourself from day one, you can build a better business on top of it. So there was a lot of values. In fact, the values you see on our website, Mike and I, my co-founder, we sat down the very first day and we wrote those down and they haven't changed. That was the very first thing that we did was sit down and write down all those values because that was, that's how important it was to us. Like if we're going to start this journey, the first step is the values and everything else comes after that. Awesome. Awesome. I love it. I love the fact that you have some great stories from Flurry moving into Outlier here. And I had a question about, uh, from all your experience building these startups, what is one expectation of building a star startup that is patently false? Because there's so, there's so many, there's, I mean, everybody's an expert on Twitter and there's mm -hmm. just, there people say stuff on Twitter. I'm just like, oh God, have you actually ever been like, a founder or are you just a Stanford grad and now you're a venture capitalist and telling us how to, uh, how us founders, how to, how to do it. Um, so what's one expectation of building a startup that is patently false in your opinion? Oh, being a founder is a horrible way to make money. A lot of people <laughs> found companies cause they're like, I want to get rich and man, it is like the worst. It is the least <laughs> likely way to make money. Uh, cause the chance of your company getting acquired, if you spend too much time reading tech crunch and the tech press, you're like, wow, I'll start a company. I'll sell it three years later. I'll be a millionaire. It'll be great. <laughs> so few companies get acquired. So few, most, all the vast majority turn into nothing. And you're left with maybe some credit card debt and, and a line item on your resume. And that's it. Like it is, if you want to make money, there's great ways to do that. I recommend going to hedge funds, by the way. It's a great way to make money. <laughs> if you want to be famous, you know, go into show business. Don't go in like the chance of reaching the kind of success most people think about in startups is so small that you really just have to love the process because mm. the, the, the journey is, can be great. It's fun. It's fulfilling. But the destinations are usually not going to be these glorious moments of, of glory frankly it's just not how it works and and can i can i ask about your this the story if you can conjure it up uh of your acquisition of flurry i don't i don't every every acquisition is different i can tell you from a from a kind of a, a generic standpoint when we when i had my acquisition nothing changed it was like <laughs> it was like a, a handshake a smile some signed documents and i was like my life is exactly the same. Should I go get a coffee now? <laughs> just like nothing actually ever changed. There was no rah, rah. There was no like, you're the man. And, and, and nobody knew. It was almost very kind of, you know, you know, I don't know. It was just very non yeah, no, climatic. It's so true. You, you expect there to be, you know, horns and parades and everything. And it ends up being a big deal to you uh, and your team. And I think if you do a good job, it's a big deal to your team. But it's just a line item in the news that day, if you're very lucky. And most of the time, it's not even that. Uh, no, you're right. There's no, no end. And I, I actually worry a lot about founders who think about the 20-hour days. They're pushing through that next milestone. They're pushing through that next bridge because mm. they think it'll get easier. They think if only I push a little bit harder, I'll get to this point where things will take over. But even through the acquisition, there's no point where you're like, you're done. There's no point where it's easy. You do the acquisition, and by the way, there's a holdback. 
Uh, and by the way, there's an earnout. Yes. And by the way, you have to do the integration. And by the way, you have to hit these milestones. And by the way, you have to do that for two to three years. There's no point where it's like, you're over the finish line, take it easy, you've done it great, yeah. you know, so that doesn't happen. And then there's new voices into the system. It said you have to scale here and scale there and do this, and then you have to hire people you don't like. <laughs> yeah, and then it, it's, I think people who do it because they want to be done, it doesn't, you're never done. I mean, even today, man, we sold Flurry in 2014. I still get people direct messaging me on Twitter asking for tech support on the Flurry product. <laughs> It's just, isn't that the irony? It's like, it's never, never dead. It's never, never is never done. It's never done. It's uh, but in, in the flip side, I will say that, you know, I look back on it when I got started with flurry, I was one of those people reading the tech press. I was like, I'm gonna do this for three years. We'll sell it. It'll be great. Uh, it was nine years of my life. Nine years is a long time, right? Like a company, it, it takes a decade to build a really big, meaningful business. A lot of stuff happens in 10 years. Oh yeah. Right? Like, I didn't have kids when I started Flurry. Like I got married, I moved to Oak. Like, I mean, you think about it at the beginning and the end, like 10 years is such a big fraction of your life, no matter how old you grow to be, that it's a big commitment. And honestly, I don't think a lot of people understand that when they're going in. And like, if, if this works, if this is successful, maybe I shouldn't be thinking about the money I'll make. Maybe I should be thinking about 10 years. Is that what I wanna spend 10 years doing? Yeah, and if I'm gonna actually survive. Did you know that there's even more value than just audio or video? Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, at VC Hunting, and make sure to sign up for the VC Hunting newsletter, where you'll be able to get weekly news on venture capital, startups, founder stories, and the occasional wisdom extracted from Peter's brain. Go to vchunting.com to sign up. And now back to the episode. Uh, so we here at uh, VC Hunting, we do a lot of digging, as you probably know. And so I've gone through your blogs, which, by the way, for everyone out there listening and watching, man, make sure you spend some time on Sean Byrne's blog. He's got some real, real golden nuggets there. But let's go back to November 11th. I really love this. November 11th, 2015. On your blog, you said the most three, three most important words as a CEO are, I don't know. When was the last time you said that? And what did you learn? Well, technically, it's, it was three and a half words because there's a contraction in there. But, you know, oh. this is startup stuff. So we're going to gloss over that, man. We're going to yeah. be, we're not going to go into the details. That's, see, that's a good message for founders out there is it's the message that matters, not the fact. You just gloss over it. Uh, I say I don't know all the time. Uh, I mean, you know, the, I think the challenge ends up being when you're sitting in front of an investor and you're trying to pitch them and they're like, what about this? Mm. You want to have the answer. You want to be the person who has all the information because for some part of you thinks that that investor wants you to be the person with all the answers. You're like, they'll invest in me if I know what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And often, you know, at this point in my career, I'm like, yeah, actually, I don't know. I can go find out. I can look into that. So that's a good question. Or I don't know. And there's maybe no way to know, you know, investors often are like, tell me about what the market's going to look like in three to four years. I don't know. And you're actually, like, that's you an outlier. Nobody, that's part of the bet. I mean, there's risk, right? I mean, part of why there is, the potential to do well in startups is there's so much risk, but risk comes from the unknown. Mm. Uh, I tell that to my team. Like a lot of times if you're the CEO, you're like, I got, my team has to believe I, I know what I'm doing. They have to believe in where we're going. And sometimes that's actually not the right move. They have to believe that it, you'll be honest with them and saying, I don't know is the best way to build that trust. And so honest, I say it all the time. I'll tell you who I said it to the most is my daughter when she's like, daddy, why is the sky orange tonight? And I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> Like oranges fell out of a plane and they, I don't know, something, I got nothing. I got nothing for you, girl. Well, we, we I wanted to also bring in a little bit of, of venture capital context and a little bit of venture mm -hmm. capital topics. Uh, you seem opinionated and you seem like you're, well, maybe, maybe, maybe this might be a fair statement. You have strong opinions, weekly held, maybe you're willing to. Oh, no, I'm very opinionated. I'm very opinionated. <laughs> very opinionated. There's no we weekly held, whatever. Here's an opinion for you. People who say I have a strong opinion, weekly held, have no opinion. That's exactly what I say. I wish I had the buzzer. Ba -ba -ba -ba. I, that's... Oh, you need a gong, man. You need a gong right on your desk right there. Let's just hit it. Just like that. Oh, there that you was, go. That's exactly what I say. When people say that I have, they have strong opinions, weekly held, I'm like, you actually probably actually never thought about this idea. So I'm going to give <laughs> yeah. you a couple seconds and let you think about it. Um, so I think we can both agree that venture capital in many different facets is relatively broken and there's opportunities for it to improve. And so this is kind of an open-ended question here. 
In what ways do you think venture capital is broken? And what do you think needs to change as we move into this new decade of 2020 to 2030? Well, the good thing about this question is that we have three hours left of the podcast, so I can get through all of my thoughts, which is great. <laughs> so how is it broken? Um, let's start out with some obvious flaws. So venture capital today is a very, um, it's not a very transparent industry. You go to a venture capital firm's website, there's no information about their process of evaluating deals. How do they source deals? What do they look for? Is there a consistent process in evaluating them? So if you talk to a venture firm and you meet with a partner, how do you know what the next step is? How do you know how long it will take? How do you even know what they're looking for? There is literally no way to know. Mm -hmm. And there's, as a result, there's also not a lot of consistency. So why is it not on their website? Because every time it might be different. There's a lot of judgment going in. The problem there as a founder is how do you know, let's say you want to raise money, will it take me a month, three months, six months? On average, it takes three months to raise a venture round. But during that three months, it's not like it's a progress bar, like I'm half done or three quarters done. You have no idea. I get a term sheet tomorrow. I can never get a term sheet. So the first problem is it's just not transparent enough. There's not enough visibility into it. And the second part is that it's honestly not diverse enough. Traditionally, how people are sourcing deals but, is but, but, through But, but, but Sean, network. come on. They all, hey, they all say that they're all about diverse diversity on their websites, though. Uh, and, and you look at the statistics, it's just not there. And it's, it's the problem is very deep. Like, the problems are very systemic, and there mm. are no easy answers. Thankfully, we're starting to see more, more investors that are women and people of color, and that's good. That's progress. But an even bigger problem is, you know, how does someone who is a founder, who is a woman or person of color, who may not have been in a Stanford fraternity or doesn't have a network of other 20 something white founder friends, how do they meet investors? Because most investors are sourcing deals through their network. You know what their networks look like? Predominantly white men. And so how do you open up that sourcing so that people have a chance to get in there? That's a very systemic problem that has to get addressed because otherwise you never see change. Like you're not going to see a lot more companies that are founders and women of color get funded until you change a system that allows that to, to work. Mm -hmm. I, I work with a, um, I'm an LP in a fund called Backstage Capital, which only invests in founders that are, are underrepresented. And the crazy thing about working with those founders that I learned is that their networks are entirely separate from the venture networks. Their social networks don't even overlap a little bit. And all you have to do is bridge those networks and connect them and great things happen. Oh, yeah. But that gap, it's like the Grand Canyon, right? How do you jump over? How do you bridge that gap? So there's a lot of opportunity to fix that. Um, regardless of the inherent sexism and racism that's existed in the industry for years, as a result of this kind of calcification, that has to be rooted out, obviously. Oh, and the I third part is, you know, there is a interesting misalignment of incentives in venture. So a venture capital firm is going to have a portfolio. I mean, I have a portfolio as an angel investor. You do too. Right. Everybody who's an investor, you invest in a lot of companies, not just one. Why? Because it's irresponsible to invest in one. Yet founders, you know what we are? We're invested in one, right? High risk. Yeah. So the portfolio investors out of my portfolio of 10 companies, I want one to be a huge success and I won't care about the other nine. That one mm -hmm. company, that huge success will pay for my whole return, right. all my investments. So they want to push you as a company to do the most aggressive strategy possible, which has the most likelihood of being a chance to produce that return. It might reduce your chances of producing any return, mm -hmm. but it increases your chances of producing an abnormally large return. Now, as a founder, what I want, I want to have a return. Mm -hmm. This is my one ship. Like I have to play this game really well. Do I care if I sell the company for $500 million or $700 million? Uh, maybe not. Maybe actually, I just want to sell the company for a lot of money and be like, that was a success. And that misalignment of incentives has manifested itself in a lot of weird ways. So first is investors will push you to take risks that you might not otherwise take. Thank you um, for saying that. I appreciate that. And the second is that they will, there's only certain kinds of businesses that can produce these kind of venture back returns, but the venture capitalist doesn't tell you that because there might be an outside chance that your direct to consumer lotion company could be a huge billion dollar business. It might not be very large, but there's a small chance they'll give you the money. Now, it turns out it's probably better not to take that venture money mm -hmm. because it's much more likely you will do well by selling your lotion company for $30 million instead of trying to turn it into a $300 million company. But that doesn't get discussed. That's not part of the conversation because again, the, 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 you're not aligned in terms of your incentives. And so what ends up happening is there's a lot of founders that raise money that never should have raised money, oh. that are pushed into riskier strategies, 
And the founder is net worse off for yes. having raised money than they otherwise would have been. And so that kind of alignment of incentives needs to get fixed. And there are things happening. There's a, there's a, a group called NDVC, which right. funds cash flow businesses that's coming out. There are alternatives. Um, but the, first, the final thing is that you look at the last eight years, right? Ever since the financial crisis, um, the interest rates have been zero. Capital has been looking for a home. Where do you right. get returns? You certainly don't get returns and in interest rates. So right. let's go everywhere else. Free the money. capital capital has to go somewhere. It sloshes around. And what ends up happening is that it falls into capital classes that mm -hmm. have no interest or have no real good reason to have it because it's just chasing the money. And so you've seen venture capital firms swell in size. You've mm -hmm. seen um, SoftBank, uh, the right. Vision Fund, materialize. These things are not a side effect of demand in the market. They're a side effect of supply. So what does that mean? We've seen an evaluation bubble where companies are having higher valuations. And why is that? In the venture world, the valuation is a side effect of a financing, not a driving force. And so if you want to, let's say you want to raise $10 million for your company, the investor wants to buy 25%. Well, your company is worth $40 million, just like that. It isn't like we did an analysis to decide you're worth $40 million. It's a side effect of the money you're raising and the, the ownership target. But as these funds got bigger, they can't make smaller investments. It used to be at Flurry in 2007, we raised a Series A, an average Series A back then, which we raised about $4 million, which I thought at the time and still think is a lot of money. Let's be honest, okay? I, I would agree, but in terms of relative scale now, that's like, that's like pre-seed, pre-pre-seed. <laughs> oh yeah, that's like a loan from your parents. Like, I mean, it's crazy. So now your, your Series A's are 50 to $20 million, which means you're worth, your valuation on paper is $50 million, which means by the way, you have to sell the company for anywhere upwards of 200, $300 million for everybody to be happy with that outcome. To make and, not, and not only that, is that often first time founders when they're, they're flooded with $50 million, they've never built a company before. And the, no. they don't know what to do with it. You haven't built a sales team. You have, I mean, there's a lot of things that come to bite you. And so that problem of supply driving structure I love that. Is a big problem. It's a big issue. It's something that will come. We're already seeing it bear out. We saw WeWork implode. Right. Um, we've seen a lot of consumer businesses being pulled back. Uh, I just saw the other day Zoom, the pizza delivery company, had to lay off 80% um, of their staff. I mean, oh, yeah. these things are going to be more common because if supply is driving demand, like imagine any economy where supply drives demand. Like it's crazy to think about supply driving demand, but that's what'd be happening. That's exactly like, what's it's happening. Kind of like, it's kind of like the Fed just printing money, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> kind of so like now that. it turns out next week on Hunting Politics, the new spinoff podcast, we're talking about fiscal policy. <laughs> maybe maybe Sean, Sean and I should go off to create a, a spinoff here and go into, uh, to, in, into politics. But let's pivot a little bit because I, I, there's a, another great blog post. I, I want to be cognizant of your time, but I want to ask you a couple more questions here. On February 5th, 2015, you had a blog post called The Last Startup Company. Oh, yes. Is Outlier your 100-year company? Now, Absolutely it, not. Absolutely not. Because that is ridiculous. <laughs> you think about these people who talk about 100-year companies. You go on Wikipedia, they have a great list of the oldest businesses in the world. And I really suggest going to check it out because it's amazing. There are businesses still active that were started in the 1600s, earlier mm -hmm. than that. And you know what they are is hotels, right. which is the only business model that still exists today that existed back then. There is no tech as an industry hasn't existed for a hundred years. So to say that I have started a hundred year company is just ludicrous. I mean, the amount of like narcissism that goes into that, you have to imagine to say that um, I, I want to build a good business. I want to build something that's sustainable. I have, I, I try, I, I divide startups into two categories to be fair. There is what I call puddles and craters. So a puddle can be big, like it's raining really hard, a big puddle forms in the sidewalk or in the road or under a bridge. I mean, puddles can get to be big, they can change the course of traffic, they can interrupt your day, they can close roads. Yeah. But once it stops raining and the water's gone, you'd have no idea it was there in the first place. Mm. There's no sign, it's disappeared. It's as if it didn't exist. And on the other side, you have craters where something like impacts the earth creates this big hole and that hole will always be there really like a huge crater most startups are puddles they can make they can get big but they go away and you never know that they were there 
Um, and you're, if you're very lucky, you can create a creator, which really changes the world. I prefer to aim towards the latter. I want to create a business that changes how something works. So Flurry was lucky enough to be at the center of mobile. We changed how people thought about mobile apps, how mm -hmm. they measured them, what they measured, how it was done. I'd like to think we were a small part of contributing to that business evolving. I think with Outlier, we're changing how people make decisions in business. And that's great. I think that's the kind of thing that can last. But that's the most you can hope for in this business. A hundred years from now, I really hope that we're on spaceships flying to some planet somewhere. We're using teleportation systems to move around. I, I hope so. We can, but I can guarantee you one thing in a hundred years that will be true is that I'm going to be dead. And so, you know what? I mean, maybe my company is still going. That's cool. But you, but you kind of ended the blog with, I, I'm, I'm going to be dead and I kind of don't care. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like something, it's not my thing. I mean, I, can you imagine the amount of, of, of self-centeredness I'd have to have to say, my kids are going to take over this company and spend their whole life building it too. I want my kids to do what my parents did for me is tell me, listen, you should pursue what you want to pursue. And that's I'm not going to burden you to run my business and what I thought, if they want to take it over, that's different. That's, that's so bad. funny. I was having a conversation. Could it couldn't have been more than a month ago with a with a founder who said something very much like that. He said, "I don't know if whether I should sell it or I should keep it for my kids." And I looked at him. And I said, "Your kids don't want your business, bro. Your business is boring. And by the time your kids are older, they're probably not going to want to do what you're doing because it's IT infrastructure. That was his his business is IT infrastructure. I'm like, trust me. No kid grows up and says, "Bro, I want to be back end." in you know infrastructure uh startup it <laughs> never happened never i'm actually happened. imagining in an elementary school what do you want to be when you grow up i want to be a firefighter i want to be an astronaut i want to run a back-end erp system that integrates seamlessly yeah. in sap and salesforce like come yes. on and i want to be in the knock right in the dungeon <laughs> uh, with, with, uh, all right so a couple more questions here i'm going to touch a little bit on a couple of personal things so so i'm, I'm just going to qualify it here but i think that you're mature and that you're, you're you'd be able to a, to answer these questions on you Twitter, haven't met me clearly <laughs> well you, we, you, can, you can always say no that you're, you're not interested i'm totally okay but no absolutely it, I, I was no really i was really curious about this on twitter on june 29th 2009 mm -hmm. you said i signed the divorce papers today yeah. The last parts of the person I used to be died a quiet death today. Mm -hmm. And the question yeah. I asked, I wrote down is, what drove you to be so public about something that I consider to be pretty damn private? I think it comes down, so I, I wasn't always that way. I think mm -hmm. I grew up in a very private, quiet family. Um, for me, what, what I learned along the way was that by then, but even by 2009, Flurry had become quite a big company. We were growing. Um, and I realized that there's a point in life where you become a role model, even if that's not what you want, even if that's not what you intend. And I always find it hilarious when athletes are like, I'm not a role model. What they really mean is I don't want to be a role model yep. because you don't get to choose. You don't get to choose who looks up to you. And you certainly can't make money by being an athlete or running a large team of people because you're making money off of those people. You're, I mean, you're making the money off the business. And so you have right. to put a good step forward. And so for me, um, talking about my struggles was a way to try to, those are the earliest attempts I had to try to change the venture equation. Because in 2009, the other thing that was true, remember the financial crisis that hit. Oh, that's right. Venture capital was still, you know, when we first raised our first round of funding from Flurry, it's still the, the depths of the dot-com bubble having burst. Um, and so the world hadn't changed the way it has today. You know, mm -hmm. you think we, I, I still want diversity to improve, but back then it was horrific. So opening up and showing that you can be vulnerable and this idea that you're a person and an employee, you're not a resource, that things approach you both ways. You can't say those things if you don't do them, right? I mean, I can't lecture people on it. So for me, it was important to be open. And the other part was that I think there's a, there's a myth of the founder out there that people look at people like Steve Jobs and they're like, I want to be like that, the perfect person, the perfect mm. founder. And he did a lot of stuff right. But I'll tell you, man, Steve is not a perfect person, right? And I'm not a perfect person. And I never wanted to perpetuate that myth because it creates a standard that isn't unachievable. Nobody's mm. perfect. So I wanted to be open about it because I didn't want people to think that, you know, my life was great. Everything was good. I had everything figured out because mm. um, nobody does. I mean, let's be honest. The people who seem like they do, they just have really good PR teams. Or they're, or they're just lying in themselves. Yeah, exactly. There's a lot of denial in there. A lot of cognitive think, dissonance there. Oh, yeah. So, uh, so in summary, I don't think you can take credit for the wins if you don't talk about the losses. I don't think you can talk about the positive or the negative. 
And so for me, you have to, you have to be both sides of it. It's, it's really important. I love that, Sean, about you. And I, I, in my heart, I knew, and in my gut, I knew that you were going to be able to answer this in a calm and, and authentic and transparent way. And that's, that's pretty much all I'll say. I really appreciate your modeling of leadership here on the show. A couple more questions from Twitter, and these are a lot more lighthearted. Uh, on, on, uh, on January 6, 2010, you said, uh, first pottery days of new year, and I forgot my tools. I'm a freaking moron. Tomorrow I'll try again. You know, I, I had a qualification for this. I had a friend who went to pottery because he was feeling depressed. And he, he went to a pottery class and he did the pottery stuff. And then right after he did all that, built up this beautiful pot. Like he literally took it, went outside and smashed it on the ground and walked away. And I was, I was thinking about this when I, when I read this. And I was wondering, was pottery back in 2010 a, 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 a way to help kind of ease the stress or, or what, what, what was it with pottery and your tools? First of all, you're, that's a horrific story because it takes a long time to make a pot. So that's yeah, like crazy. I know. He was there for like four hours and then he smashed oh, it. Oh, God. Um, no. So I, that was a point in my life where I realized that I had to start to change how I approach things. So what I mean by that is up until that point, I'd always put myself in positions where I was comfortable or I had thought it through. I thought it was a good idea. And what I realized was I'd built up this strange bias where I was selecting things that I knew I'd be good at, or I was selecting environments where I knew what the outcome would look like, and it was too predictable. And so I got to this point where I was like, you know what, I have to start doing some things that I think are bad ideas, or things that I don't know what's gonna happen, or put myself in awkward situations. So I started to do things like, you know, travel via backpacking, just go stay at hostels and go places, have no idea where I'm going, have no idea what I'm doing, just show up with a backpack and just try to figure it out. Um, I took things like, I, I had always been an artist, but I'd worked in things like woodworking and in areas where everything was precisely measured and, right. and ceramics are not like that. Ceramics, you got no control over it. And so I started doing stuff like that to put myself in new environments and challenge myself to adapt when I didn't choose the environment, it was happening to me. And so overall, it was a great adventure. I ended up doing ceramics for seven years. Um, I started volunteering. I met my wife volunteering. That was good. Overall, it ended up being a, a great adventure and challenging myself. Then, of course, I had kids, and that's like just basically what you do all day is get challenged in new ways that you don't expect. Exactly. Um, but I do think that activities like uh, not everybody's an artist. Not everybody has to do art. But I think as a founder, it's really important to have an activity like that because so little of what we do every day is in our control. So little of what we do can we actually manage. And so being able to sit down at a pottery wheel with a, with a hunk of clay and, and turn it into something and have full control over it as if you're the god of this little world of this little piece of clay. It's a way of taking back the agency that you lose. It's a way of taking back control in a little part of your life. And it helps with the stress a lot because you, you can't control everything. But if you control just one little thing for a little bit of your week, it actually makes the whole journey a lot easier. So it paid off in a lot of ways. I'm glad I did it. I was really just disappointed when that pottery studio closed down, but it's, uh, I still have it all. I have a lot of pottery, man, like a lot. It's in boxes. There's a lot of it. I love it. Well, I, I love the, and there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of cool nuggets here and it's, it's just great for you to be able to communicate this and, and having a beginner's mindset, even as a leader and people look up to you to, to force yourself in unknown positions with unknown outcomes really stretches the mind and continues to keep you humble. Last, last question here, Sean, this has been a great conversation, a life giving conversation to me. I'm so glad that I slid into those DMS, but the, the last question today is from October 10th. We're going way back. October 10th on Twitter in uh, 2007, I was really confused when I read this. You said, the best of the 80s is an oxymoron. I disagree. I disagree. I disagree. I disagree, Sean. Because the 80s was when I, you know, I go, those are my best, those are my formulative years, man. I, 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 before I answer that, I just point out that, that uh, I was a very early user of Twitter back when there was no vowels in the name of the service. Uh, okay. And there was a time when, so Flurry was based in San Francisco and in the Bay Area, there were no tech companies in San Francisco. They were all down the peninsula in Silicon right. Valley. Um, and so Twitter was one of the other mobile, well, other startup companies in San Francisco. So we had a lot of interesting like, you know, uh, links because there weren't a lot of companies or there was like seven or eight startup companies in San Francisco. So I, I, I jumped on it early just out of that kind of camaraderie of both being in the city. And now, of course, San Francisco has gone crazy with it. 
Uh, but man, like the 80s, uh, did the hair. What do like, you have against the 80s? Have you seen man? a movie from the 80s recently? Do you see how we used to dress? Like, come on, man. Like, it was never, at least the 70s. Let me say this about the 70s. Okay, disco is, we're never going back, let's be honest. But they had, they had ambition. Like, they were like, <laughs> I know this looks ridiculous, but I'm going to wear it in public anyway. They didn't mess around. The 80s, it's like, come on, man. Like, honestly, it's just, I, and I, I can prove it to you, which is that on the radio, there's like the best, the 60s stations, there's the 70s stations, there's even the 90s stations. There's no such thing as the 80s stations. Those don't exist. Nobody has those because nobody wants to go back again. You know, I'm actually thinking about that. I think you're actually right. Oh, no, I'm absolutely right. I stand by that tweet from a long time ago in a far off place. <laughs> Absolutely. It's like 13, yeah, 13 years yeah. ago. Uh, I, I think you have me stumped here. I think you're right. I don't think there is the best <laughs> the 80s panel. Like no one, what the hell? There you what go. Hell, guys. Well, guys, thank you. This has been a life-giving conversation. I'm blessed, Sean, that you took this time to talk with me. I'm going to give you the final word here. Where can everyone out there, the founders, entrepreneurs, and VCs, learn more about you, Sean Burns, and Outlier? Sure, you can find Outlier. It's outlier.ai. Uh, I also have a blog, uh, seanonstartups.co, or you find me on Twitter. Um, it's just S. Burns. Um, I'm sure there'll be a link somewhere around that you can find me. Absolutely. All this information is going to be in the show notes below. Thanks again, Sean Burns. We'll talk soon. Thanks for having me. True startup story time. Guys, as a founder, I'm often asked, what are my go-to tools and technology that I use as a beginner startup? Well, that's easy. One of them is Dropbox. Dropbox is the easiest way to ensure that all your files and documents are synced on all devices, whether it be mobile, your local desktop, or remote. We want to thank Dropbox for supporting vchunting.com and make sure to get your 30-day trial free at dropbox.com business. Wow, wow, wow. What a great conversation that I had with Sean Burns. I hope you guys really enjoyed it. Now, Sean Burns isn't a full-time venture capitalist. He's an angel investor. And you guys know, well, this is called the VC hunting uh, segment of our show here on this YouTube channel. We generally invite full-time venture capitalists. But as you guys may remember, I like to... Be mostly just because it's my show and I can do whatever the hell I want. <laughs> I enjoy inviting uh, non-full-time venture capitalists on the show as well. You'll remember that I also in, uh, interviewed Kevin Lee with Emmy. He's a founder now. He used to be a venture capitalist, but he's a founder. He's going back into the game. And you'll also remember my interview with Jeff Haney of Pinpoint, in which I am, am an angel investor, actually. Actually, factually, I was literally the first money in Booyah! And they're doing swimmingly, guys. And so if you look up my Twitter, you'll see that it says Angel Pinpoint. Um, what you don't see is all the other angel investments that I made that didn't work out. <laughs> that's, what, that's, what, that's what Twitter's for, is only showing the good side of things. But Sean Burns, I knew I was going to have a great conversation with him. And, and you guys know... Look at all this. Look at all these notes, guys. So make sure that you check out vchunting.com slash Sean Burns if you want to see all the notes that I wrote uh, about him. But I knew that he was it was going to be a great conversation because of all the research that I did, he has a spine. You see, he has opinions, and that's good. You know, there's a lot of people on Twitter that have opinions, and they spout it off, but then when people engage and push back, they don't respond because, you know, they didn't, they didn't. They don't really want to engage. They just want to tell you how to live your life. They just want to tell you what you should do and what you shouldn't do according to their anecdotal evidence and their very limited experience in whatever they're talking about. But I knew that Sean Burns was the type of guy who is transparent, honest, candid, has a, an opinion, has a spine, and because he's data-oriented, I knew that if... He was given great information or counter, inf you know, information counter to his worldviews or his models that he would take it seriously. He would consider it and he, it would inform his decisions differently if you could persuade him. But I just loved and I knew that this conversation was going to be good because of the blog posts I read because of and this is interesting. The, the blog posts for me, if you go to if you go to uh, in, and all the show notes are going to be below. 
but if you take some time to read his blog, it'll actually inform you as to why he built his company after he, after he built Flurry, which was acquired in 2014, as you guys heard, and then he built Outlier. You can see like his growth through his blog posts up to Outlier, and when you read the, you know, the webpage of Outlier, when it talks about values, principles, like the, the driving facets of their business and, the, and their culture, you can completely see that what they said and what they have written on this website, the Outlier, is true. The man lives the game. The man is transparent around that. And I, and I wrote down here, you know, I love how outspoken and transparent he is uh, about everything. And which allowed me, and, and which is, which I was a little nervous, and you guys saw in, 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 the, in the conversation here when I brought up his divorce, right? I mean, how often in, 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 a, in a live interview being recorded is someone going to ask you about, hey, how was, your, how, did, how was your divorce? But I loved his response, right? On June 29th, 2009, he said, I signed the divorce papers today. The last parts of the person I used to be died a quiet death day today. And, you know, the question I wrote down is, what drove you? To be so public about something that I consider to be pretty damn private. I loved his answer. His answer came from the heart. It was real. He's an imperfect man like everybody else. And I think for him, being a leader, being being a leader means that part and parcel with being a leader is just being honest, authentic, truthful to who you are. You're a flawed. You're not perfect. You make mistakes. And I think, I think it sets a great tone for the culture at his company. I think it sets a, sets a great model of behavior uh, at his company because he's willing to be real. He's willing to show the real real. He's willing to show that he, he's got scars. He's got scar tissue. He's, got, he's, he's had issues. He's had problems. It, go into his blog. He talks about those things as well. And see, these are the type of people that make great stories. These are the type of people that I enjoy talking about because the conversations are life-giving. They're not just some flaccid, vapid conversation with, with the, the same overused, you know, highfalutin terms of venture capital. I mean, we, I don't think we used a whole lot of jargon, actually, in our interview, which tells me that, you know, he's not of that, not of that world, which is great which is great. So I just love this conversation. I hope you guys pulled out a lot. I hope you guys also had some time to really listen to his ideas around how venture capital was broken, which is completely uh, supported by everything that I've experienced in venture capital in that, you know, there's no transparent process. The incentivizations are different. It's a supply. It's crazy that venture capital is a supply, uh, a supply based system. There's just so much money. And so there's, there's just so many things wrong with venture capital. I'm glad that I had that opportunity to talk with Sean about it. This, I highly recommend, and I don't always say this in all of my retrospectives, but I highly recommend that you follow Sean Burns. And you can find all the information below. But Sean, fo follow him. He's got some great opinions. He's got some great ideas. And his company is really, really, really unique. So especially if you're in, in, in you, you run a company, or are you in, in needing uh, a system to help you understand the plethora of data that you're collecting, you might want to check out Outlier and Sean Burns, the CEO. Uh, they might be able to help you. I hope, again, uh, this is, was just a great conversation. I'm just being raw here, and, and you know, there's just so many notes that I could talk about, but watch the episode again. Enjoy it. It's a great conversation. If you want to learn more about Sean Burns and Outlier and everything that he's all about, make sure that you check out vchunting.com slash Sean Burns. Man, yeah, it's a great one, man. It's a really fun conversation. I, 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 I really respect him for his candor, his honesty, and transparency. I mean, life-giving, man. We'll see you guys next time. Thank you.